Today is our chance to return to Venezuela, our last was before Little Venice. What's the story of Little Venice, Venezuela? Well, the earliest explorers who came here, all they saw on the Caribbean coast was a very small tree. They saw little villages on stilts, and they're on stilts, so at night, they don't get picked by mosquitoes. They're up above the water for health reasons. So they said, well, we know a major city, Venice in Europe, which is also on stilts. These are just little villages, so they named the area Little Venice, which is now Venezuela. I see. Is that, that's the I did not know that. So we, all, we all learn something. Why Venezuela's name is Venezuela. Uh, it's a great honor to really, uh, re you know, welcome uh, two Venezuelan specialists on, on their country. Margarita Lopez Maña y Luis. Y Luis tuvo un percance. He had a problem with uh, his visa, which uh, was, was uh, had, he had a run -off. We were running, but he got almost hit. didn't show up. So we we're really pleased that he's here today and very happy. He's, he's going, Luis is going to go over the results of the elections, and we will make sense of uh, the, the meaning of. Uh, this incredible event, which many have referred to as a turning point in Venezuelan politics, a new chapter, those are the kind of words that are being used to refer to the December 6 elections. Frankly, here at the center, we were very surprised, even though we had seen the polls before, some of the polls, but we were very surprised at the outcome. The opposition, uh, Democratic Union, won by a uh, landslide at 67% of the votes? No. 56%. 56, but with 67% of representation. Oh, the representation of the vote was 56% and the escaños, the, the representation is 67%. Mm -hmm. So they have control, technically, mm -hmm. of, the, of the National Assembly. So the historic event, we'll see some, it'll be a very exciting year, 2016. And uh, it's, it's really with great uh, excitement and, and, and uh, uh, curiosity that we return to Venezuela, which we should not have never have left as a major area focus of study here at the Builder Center. You, you may see more of that in, in the month to come, and certainly next year at some points here. So any ideas you may have, we would like to hear them. Again, we have coffee and some cookies left, maybe. And they come at five and they leave. So you want to do if you want coffee or tea, do it now. Later after five, and we way too late. <coughs> after five, we'll have a little bit of wine or vino de honra to honor your the guest, the distinguished guest from Venezuela. So uh, we're going to get started, and then we'll we'll, we'll ask the speakers to 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 be. You know, relatively succinct and to the point in terms of 15, no more than 20 minutes presentation, and then we'll time to have discussions and to take whatever questions you may have. Luis, which, who will be presenting the results of the elections, will be, will be presenting in, in Spanish. We will translate. How many people here do not understand Spanish? One, two, three, four, five, enough. So we will translate. Larry, you don't know Spanish. No. I'm surprised. My father was fluent and he worked for the United Fruit Company in Honduras, but he never taught me Spanish. He never taught me Spanish. So he would be happy with the Mr. Trump. <laughs> so we're going to translate as effectively as we can. As, uh, and again, we hope that you can hear us way back there. They do? Good. So um, again, the programs that you all have or should have contains all of the information you need to introduce the speakers. Margarita Luis, Margarita, the only thing that is not there that's this last year, this last semester, she's completing a, uh, a, 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 fellowship. a fellowship. Visiting fellowship. A visiting fellowship a fellow at the Wilson Center at Princeton University, where she taught a course on and directed participatory democracy in Latin America and, and Venezuela. And then the election happens, we had a lot of students, a lot of, yeah. a lot of interest in this stuff. It was crowded, yes. So she, they are going to be returning to Venezuela soon, next semester? Next month, yes. 
Yeah, it's so good to see you, and we're, we're delighted that you were able to accept our invitation. And the reason we chose on December 21st is because there were no other options. They leave, you know, you go back in January. That's right. So thank you again. So we're going to start, Margarita, why don't you give us a sense of uh, Venezuela crisis, elections, and the future. I know you have very strong points, and you have uh, a sure judgment on what's going on, and you're going to be somewhat critical. If you're not, if you don't share your views, we'll have plenty of time to debate whatever positions you have. And uh, please raise issues, because we want to do in clarity. We are not selling anyone necessarily in any one interpretation. And then Luis is going to present the results, as I just said, of the, of the elections. So, Margarita, you want to... So, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here. I want to thank Professor Mauricio Font for the invitation. <clears throat> my student, Jonathan, that didn't count, but he was the one that put us in contact at Princeton University. And to all of you, welcome for coming on some short notice. What I'm going to do first is, in the presentation is to give you the general context in, in which happens these elections, these elections happen. Because I think that we have to, Venezuela is full of events and facts, right? But we have, I'm a historian, and as, and as such, I think we have to go like behind a little bit and take a little bit of perspective. Why these results? Why, what is the general context in which these results happen? The first thing that I must say is that Venezuela, you most, most of you must know, is living a very deep crisis, a global, extensive economic, social, political, moral, cultural crisis. And that crisis has many layers. I tell my students it's like an onion. It has layers and layers. And at the core of that, of that onion, the problems are structural problems that are prior of the era of Chavismo. They are, they, and they, and, and the, main, the main core of that problem is the incapacity of the Venezuelan elites and I would say the Venezuelan society to come up with an alternative model, economic model, that could overcome the, the, the flaws of oil economy, of oilmentism economy. This had, had brought us to our knees in the 80s and the 90s to a very deep global and extensive crisis that is very much similar to the crisis we are living today. And it was the, the movement of Hugo Chavez Frias, this Bolivarian movement that, that won the elections in 1998 that offered the Venezuelan people to overcome that global and structural crisis. However, after 17 years uh, in which we had, there was an experimentation called Participatory Protagonistic Democracy First, and afterwards, a radicalization of that political program into socialism of the 21st century. I think it has been clear once the drop of the oil crisis was produced in beginning 2014, now, yet, now already in two years in this oil uh, drop price in the international markets, that this political problem has failed to overcome the structural problems of Venezuela. And as a result of that, the opening of the deep crisis that in my opinion, it is the same crisis. The same crisis that was not resolved in the 80s and the 90s during these 17 years. But it was hidden through an oil prosperity because the oil prices have been very high for many years, almost 10 years in a row. But when the prices dropped, the crisis appeared again and worse. And worse because the model of socialism of the 21st century uh, uh, accentuated, emphasized, highlighted uh, some of the decisions that were taken before in the 70s and the 80s uh, in what we, we call the Venezuela a state capitalism. So it, it is in this context where the election has happened and the results talk about, the, uh, what the uh, send a message about what the people think has been the performance of the Maduro government in the last years around this global crisis. <coughs> This is just a graphic that you can see the oil prices. We had two big peaks, one in 2008, one in the beginning of 2012, where the oil prices were around $120 a barrel, the basket, the, the, the average basket of Venezuela. Since 2014, it's been dropping. We have now two years when the price has been lowering. And it, 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 it finished last week at an average of $29. This, this the basket. So 
This is not the cause of, of the structural problems of Venezuela. But this, of course, makes it worse because it shows the incapacity of the oil rentism to overcome the ups and downs of the prices in the international market and to bring to Venezuela a healthy economic model that could make the Venezuelan people sustain themselves in an economy, in a healthy economy that could feed them and give them all that what is necessary for their well-being. And so we are people that live in these cycles of prosperity and misery, and we have been doing this for the last almost 100 years. What are the root explanations of the failure of the Chavista project? Now, more specifically, now, this, this is the general context, the, 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 the deep layers of the onion, but <coughs> what happened with the, with the Chavista project and the economic model? Uh, in, as an economic model, Chavismo never gave, us, never gave a serious thought of, about overcoming oil rentism. Venezuela lives on what it, not on what it produces inside the country, but on this oil income that it comes from the international markets. And when the prices go up, we live as, as, as millionaires. And when it goes down, we live miserably. And this has brought, this, we, we, have, we have been an oil economy for about 100 years. And that has shaped not only the economy, bringing us this, this uh, extreme fragility vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, the oil prices in the international market, but it also has shaped our society uh, in a way that the society today is a society very much accustomed to consume goods above what it really produces to earn them. And so Venezuelans are very uh, demanding of goods, and, and, and those demands have increased in the last years uh, Venezuelans have a very strong discourse of, of rights, the rights to, uh, uh, to have uh, goods, because we are an oil economy and we are a, a rich country. And it has shaped also a state, a very inefficient and corrupt state that is the petro state. And Terismo really did not overcome any of these problems because it never gave a serious thought about changing the economic model of rentism. What did it do? All these things that you may have heard of units of production in the socialist model, such as um, in the beginning, the co-ops were giving a lot, cooperatives were giving a lot of money, but then we had the endogenous units uh, <laughs> of production. Then we had the fundos amoranos, the farms, cattle farms, small, uh, given in, to, to, to people to go, come back, to, to go back to, to, to to the interior of the country and, and cultivate or, or raise cattle and so on. Uh, and we had also, finally, the most famous that have been the communal councils that were supposed to bring the socialist production in a collective, uh, in a social uh, property and collectively. But none of these things really had a plan, had been planned with a strategy of bringing in a real economic alternative. It, it, their prior, uh, targets were really the unemployment that was very high in Venezuela, give employment to the people, distribute oil income <coughs> to the poor, and win elections. Those were really the main targets of these, of these uh, economic uh, socialist model. And there was ne never a really a serious thought of planning in the short, middle, and long term an alternative to state capitalism. So Venezuela has lived uh, because of that, the same problems that it lived in the 20th century. A severe dependency on the oil prices, a severe Dutch disease. Those of that economists know that uh, there are some countries, especially the countries that live on these strategic products of the international capitalist market, such as gas, oil, copper, etc., that when a, a, a big flow of foreign uh, currency comes into the country, it brings this kind of prosperity, but it at the same time over evaluates uh, the, the currency of the country. And in the middle term, it produces a great dependency on importation. And once the prices, if the prices fall, that all of a sudden you find the country unable to import its goods with, the, with uh, an industrial, uh, with its industry broken, with its, its fields uh, 
that have not been producing, and it opens again into a cycle of misery. The Dutch disease was diagnosed for certain economies. It's called Dutch disease because it, it, was, it was diagnosed in Holland in the 70s to do, during the gas uh, bonanza of prices. And Venezuela has suffered this in the 70s and before that, and now in a very severe way. And as I said, socialism basically was understood as the distribution of oil revenues. What really was the core of the Venezuelan socialist model, the Chavista socialist model, was this idea that the oil revenues for all of us and it could be distributed to, it should be distributed more to the poor. And, and, and it was, and, and in, in a way, some of the social, uh, immediate social problems, the missions that were uh, developed during these terms did bring some of our social indicators, indexes, um, improved uh, indexes of poverty, of access to education, etc. But there was really never a planning in the immediate, in the in the middle and long term as to an alternative to uh, to the oil uh, to the oil economy, the oil rentals. And then in terms of the political project, in terms of, 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 of the political dimension of this project, the other, the other great witness of this project is that everything relied on a charismatic leader. I mean, all the transformation of that Venezuela was going to do was going to be the, the, the work of a charismatic leader. This, this, this brings us back to Max Weber and his sources of legitimacy, in which he says, well, there are three sources of legitimacy in any political order, these three pure types of legitimacy, and usually in, in moments of change, um, in moments of foundation of churches, in moments of revolution, appears a charismatic leader. And the legitimacy of the transformation relies on, on first on a charismatic leader, and then it builds up into some uh, politi stable political order. So we. This happened in Venezuela with the, with the rise of Hugo Chavez Frias, a very emblematic and charismatic leader. He, uh, he is also, besides a charismatic leader, a populist uh, a leader, a man that exercises politics in a populist way, trying to erode all kinds of mediation to make a direct relation with his followers and with the people. So in this sense, he tended to destroy and effectively destroyed uh, the representative liberal institutions in Venezuela. Uh, but, but there was a small problem, and it is that Chavez died in March 2015. So the big stone of the legitimacy of this transformation all of a sudden was not there. It was not there, and this huge vacuum that happens in Venezuela in 2013 must be substituted, as Max Weber also tells us, through some kind of routinization of the charisma. It must be, uh, charisma is not transferable, and so you have to find a way to change the legitimacy into some kind of other kind of legitimacy that can bring stability, um, reliability, and, and, uh, and, and institution. And what has been happening in Venezuela is that, mm, this routinization that the Maduro government has tried, and those who, who followed uh, uh, Chavez and that uh, continue trying to enforce his transformation, have, been, have failed in this routinization of the charisma, in my opinion, because they took a path that is, not, uh, that is a path of, uh, uh, of another kind of, of um, legitimacy that is called the traditional neopatrimonial. Legitimacy. It is not a legal, a modern form, a rational legal form, a democratic form of routinization of the charisma, but it, they took the path of a routinization through uh, uh, the, uh, the enforcement of a, of a political order that relies on tradition and patrimonial uh, tools. At the same time, and this has proved with the drop of the oil prices that it's not sustainable in Venezuela because traditional neopatrimonial legitimacies also need a lot of petrodollars to, so that the people will come out and vote for you when you have blurred the public, the public with the private, when you have sustained that you have the right to, to rule because you are the, the disciples, the followers, the ones that knew the legacy, the, the, those that have the legacy of Hugo Chavez, and that the others do not have the right to rule because they did not agree with the project of Hugo Chavez. They did not love him. 
they, they were not loyal to that project. You have to have at least, because there's not, the charisma is not there, you have to deliver some goods, everyday goods, and, and, and it's something the Maduro administration and the Chavez administration did not have. It's, a, it's an efficient, um, transparent, um, delivery and, and administrative apparatus. So that's on one side. And the other side, the exercise of power through populism in Venezuela has, has had brought, has, has obtained some levels uh, in the exercise of power in the Petrotech and practically, and we could say that it has eroded all kinds of institutions of mediations and institutions in Venezuela, bringing us practically in, in, in a continuous rupture without the construction of a new institutions that could stabilize a new political order and causing uh, the rupture of the, old, uh, of the old ways of living, of the peaceful ways of living, bringing us in what we could call violence, an, an anomic society, a society like maybe Rousseau would say, of everybody against everybody. Nobody respects the laws, uh, and starting with the government that does not, does not respect the constitution and the laws, and, and continuing with all social economic sectors in Venezuela. Just to get, just very briefly now, I think those are, in general, the basic weaknesses of what happened with the, uh, the, the Chavista project. It, went, it is in a severe, in a severe crisis, and, and the, the, the global crisis of the society we can il illustrate with certain figures as the following. Inflation in Venezuela falls in 2014, or, uh, 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 grows to, uh, to a 68.5%. This year, we don't have numbers because the government decided not to give any more numbers, official numbers. The Central Bank of Venezuela was, was said to not give any more numbers. But the IMF is calculating that we, our inflation will, co will, will go up to 160%. Some others have already calculated in Venezuela that it is above 180. But that is to have an idea of the failure of the economic model when the oil prices drop. Um, the GDP closed last year in, in minus four. This year should be closing in minus eight or minus nine or minus 10, depending on the source that you use because the government does not give official numbers. Uh, the last number of scarcity, a full scarcity in Venezuela was given by the Central Bank of Venezuela in April 2014, and it averaged a 30% in full, full goods. Afterwards, surveys done by that analysis in March of 2015 said it had reached 57%. It has not improved since then. If anything, it has worsened, but really we do not have more, more numbers. It, we, we would have to use different sources, but I think we, this is, is bad enough so that we can retain this number in the, middle, in the beginning of 2015. The scarcity of medicines is a tragedy in Venezuela. Last year, the, 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 the Pharmaceutical Federation of Venezuela calculated the scarcity of medicines in 60%. Some of you may have heard um, the information in the press about children dying of leukemia because there's, there's not enough components to do the chemios. People die. Uh, there's, it, there's a lot of scarcity for Parkinson, diabetes, uh, thyroid, et cetera, et cetera. People line up. But the, the most evident, I think, uh, uh, reality of this are the, are the huge uh, lines for food, for medicines, and I think goods that are going on in Venezuela and cities. Um, and the salary raises have fallen behind inflation since 2009, uh, with the exception of 2012. That was the last year that Chavez was in campaign. This is just very quickly the relation between the, 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 the raises of the minimum wage, because the other wages, the other wages are, are not um, raised by decree, only the minimum wage. We have in one column the minimum wage wages, how they have been. Raising this year, there were four raises by decree. However, the, uh, the variation was a 55.9 percent, and the inflation is going to fall and it's going to go to 160. So these raises do not compensate for the huge uh, inflation that we are living, bringing an impoverishment of all the society. I can say that my salary, I am a senior professor of the Central University of Venezuela. My salary does, does not account to $100 right now at the exchange rate of $200 uh, per dollar. So 
if that is my my salary as a, as a high ranked university professor, you can can imagine the other salaries be, below. And that is why people also have to line up to buy the foods because the food is in those lines. You can get you may have access to regulated prices of the basic goods such as corn flour, rice, uh, the diapers for the children, the milk, etc. So last year, the fall of uh, the, the poverty had raised to 48%, according to a research done by the Central University uh, experts of the Central University of Venezuela, Catholic <coughs> University, and Simon Bolivar University. This figure is identical to the figure that uh, was in 1998 when Chavez won the presidency. So we are back again, in a way, in many indexes, we are back again to the, the end of the 20th century. And it's one of my points that it is the, really the real, the same, uh, same crisis, that if you do not resolve it, it just comes back and haunts you. So if this was in 2014, probably this year, most of the families of Venezuela are going to finish in poverty because this year, with 160% of inflation, the situation has just worsened. The improvements in the right to education that have been important in Venezuela until 2011, 2012, are beginning to be reversed. People, the children are dropping out of the schools. This year, they had, the government had to do a decree so that they didn't have to go with uniform because the government cannot afford to give them the uniforms. However, uh, many schools, today elementary schools, uh, do not have the, the, the meals that they used to have in the past. So many children do not go because they don't have what to eat. There are very serious problems of nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. And this is, I could say that education was one of the plus of uh, Chavez's regime. I don't want to go into, the, into um, health, because in health, they were never very good. They, they had a lot of problems with their health uh, policies. As I talked about an anomic society, we are here is one of the examples. We have murder rates one of the highest in the world, 82% homicides per 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, unofficially, because the, the government does not give official numbers either, so for now for several years. Uh, this was in 2014. The, the, the government has put in place 25 security plans in 16 years. They have all fe uh, uh, failed to correct the, the problems of violence in Venezuela. Uh, in summary, what I want to say at least in this first presentation, this first class, is that the absence of a leader, the severe inefficiencies and incapacities of the administrative apparatus that he led, and that is today uh, headed by President uh, uh, Nicolás Maduro, and the fall of the oil prices have brought Venezuela to a massive crisis. Chavismo and his party to, uh, to what seems like an irreversible decline of the Chavista project much in a similar way as it was the decline of the representative democracy of the bipartisan system it, uh, at the beginning of the 80s. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Luis is going to take us through results from the elections and uh, try to explain how it was possible that a, a regime, a government that was very popular in terms of voting, the last elections, all with uh, was able to win now uh, this last December 6th, a uh, landslide and uh, turning point. Luis is going to be using s Spanish. We're going to be translating, and hopefully, someone in the audience will help me translate. Let me go. So let's go. Luis. Bueno, buenas tardes, y muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Y agradezco también que yo hice una presentación, igual que estoy hablando, yo hice la presentación en español. Y tuvieron la gentileza de, de traducirla. Entonces vamos a hacer una cosa bilingüe aquí. Oh, well, we already translated good, that's great. <laughs> 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 bueno, voy a básicamente hacer dos cosas. Eh, voy a presentar a, eh, resultados de las elecciones más o menos detallados, pero pasándole rápido, este... Cualquiera que esté especialmente interesado podemos luego conversarlo con más detalle. Y luego hacer una, una discusión como a la luz de las elecciones estas de diciembre, 
puede evaluarse el sistema electoral venezolano. ¿Cuáles son las fortalezas y debilidades del sistema electoral venezolano? Eh, bueno, visto a lo largo de todos estos años, pero muy particular, muy específicamente centrándonos en, esta, en estas elecciones recientes de diciembre. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Is that okay, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Bueno, comenzando por lo obvio y que, y que, bueno, eso fue noticia de primera plana en la mayor parte de la prensa del mundo. En las elecciones del 6 de diciembre ganó la oposición. Eso es claro. Ahora, ¿por qué ganó la oposición? Bueno, claramente ganó la oposición porque sacó más votos. Eh, estos votos que están allí en el sistema electoral venezolano, el elector en elecciones parlamentarias tiene dos votos, uno que se llama voto lista y otro que es un voto nominal. Estos que están aquí son los resultados que son los más fáciles de agregar, los resultados de los votos lista de las dos grandes alianzas que se presentaron en las elecciones, que fue el, la Mesa de Unidad Democrática y el Gran Polo Patriótico. Y ahí están, entonces vemos que la, 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 la Mesa de Unidad Democrática en voto lista nacionalmente sacó algo más de dos millones de votos por encima del Gran Polo Patriótico. Do you need translation for that? It, he is using the list. It, the Venezuelan electoral system is mixed. It's a, it's a combination of nominal with list candidates. And these numbers correspond to the list, the number of the list candidates. They are more or less the same. They, they, they vary. The, the, the variation isn't, isn't that great. But, in, but these are, because these are for the parties of the opposition versus the parties of the, of, of the government. So in, in those numbers correspond 7,720,000 versus 5,615,000. When you say list, that means like a slate? No. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sí, a slate. Una lista. The, the parties put in a list that their candidates, and then each Venezuelan, depending on the circuit that you are, you have, you can vote, but you both have two votes. The vote of the list, you choose one, 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 party. one party or one list, and then you can choose by name and last name your preferred candidates. So uh, if, in some circuits, you can choose two candidates by name, and, but only one by list always in all, the, in all the circuits. So these are the votes that correspond to the, to the, the sum of the circuit uh, by list candidates. The number of votes that you have like in the U.S. by, by, name. You have, by no, name, that you name. vote by name. You vote for the candidate that you prefer. The names are there, and you choose what name you want. And the list, you just vote for the, for the, the, party, the, the party. And is there a room, sorry, we're back to the last. Uh, is there a room for contradiction? Maybe. Yeah, supposedly, yes, you but these, like the elections in Venezuela are so polarized that that That, it that it, it, it's irrelevant. <laughs> it may, I don't think it comes to 1% this time, did it come? Yeah, Less than 1%. So it really isn't relevant because it's such a polarized situation that the people just vote in favor or against these elections that have a plebiscitarian logic, more than a representative logic. La oposición también ganó, no solamente porque sacó más votos, sino porque le fueron asignados más diputados. Eh, a la oposición se le asignaron 112 diputados, mientras que al Gran Pueblo Patriótico se le asignaron 55 diputados. También el, la oposición ganó en más estados de los que ganó el Gran Pueblo Patriótico. La oposición ganó en 18 estados, mientras que el Gran Pueblo Patriótico ganó en 6. Y también la oposición ganó en más circuitos electorales, que, que el Gran Polo Patriótico ganó en 61 circuitos electorales, mientras que el Gran Polo Patriótico ganó en 29. Esto es simplemente para ilustrarle la, nuevamente el resultado, votos en listas por Estado para los, dos, para los dos grandes alianzas que se presentaron en estas elecciones. Están marcados allí en, en azul los estados donde ganó, donde ganó la oposición y en rojo los estados donde ganó el oficialismo. Lo que decíamos antes, de 18 estados ganó 
la oposición y en seis estados ganó el oficialismo, están allí marcados. Quizás valga la pena este, resaltar una cosa acá, que es que en los estados donde ganó el oficialismo, donde el gran pueblo patriótico, son en general, no totalmente, pero son en general los estados menos poblados. El único estado donde el, ganó el oficialismo, donde votaron más el estado portuguesa, todos los demás es menos de 400 mil electores, siento que hay estados en Venezuela, por ejemplo, el estado más grande, el, el, el más grande en términos electorales, que es el estado Zulia, allí votan casi dos millones de, de personas. The, the, the six states where the, the government won are states that have scarce population, less population. They, they are, it's, yeah, the people that vote. Uh, and those are in red. The one that has the most population is the state Portuguesa. But the, and they are basically the rural states of Venezuela too. So that's where the, the, the Chavismo still has a heavy uh, support. Uh, esta es la distribución de los diputados para cada estado. ¿Cuántos diputados en, en Venezuela? El sistema este electoral es un sistema que combina criterio territorial con criterio poblacional para determinar cuántos diputados se eligen en cada estado. Eh, todo estado, por ser estado, tiene tres diputados y encima de esos tres diputados, por cada 1,1% de la población del país que reside en ese estado, se le asigna un diputado adicional. Eso hace que haya eh, eh, Estados como el Estado Zulia, que pues, repito es el estado más, más poblado del país, donde se eligen 15 diputados. Estos son los diputados. Lo... 11 y 1. Sí, pero aquí estamos hablando de los diputados nominales. No sé por qué está puesto esto aquí ahora. Me cambiaron el idioma y ahora. Bueno. <risa> eh, pero bueno, lo que digo, que depende de la, de la población, no hay ningún estado que tenga menos de tres diputados. Eh, que es el estado Amazonas y el, el estado más poblado tiene 15 diputados. Bueno, allí hay una distribución de diputados. Yeah, the, 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 the number of deputies is calculated on a base of territory and population. So the, the, the states that have less population have less deputies. All the states have three, and the, the ones that have the most population, that is Zulia, has 15. Uh, but all of them have three, and then depending on the, the population that they have, they may have four, six, eight, ten, or up to 15. And that is calculated on a more complex system that I can explain in English. <laughs> no, eh, eh, esta, eh, sí, efectivamente, me confundí con la traducción acá. Esto no es distribución de, esto es lo que es distribución de circuitos electorales. Mm. Uh, no son constituency, uh, sería... Electoral circuits? Yeah. Okay. Districts, right? District, district, no? District, yeah. electoral district. Yeah. Eso entonces, bueno, ahí ven que, 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 bueno, nuevamente no depende esto de la población, sino depende del diseño que se hace en los circuitos. Ahí el, el estado donde se eligen menos diputados que mencioné es el estado Amazonas. Ahí hay un solo circuito, que es todo el estado, mientras que el estado donde hay más, se eligen más diputados, se eligen, ahí hay 12 circunscripciones. En 11 ganó el, la oposición y en 1 ganó el oficialismo. You also saw that there were three indigenous um, representatives at the National Assembly. The three were won by um, organizations that are, uh, that, that tend, that, that are linked to the opposition also. So that, that, that's what brings us, brings the opposition to 112 deputies the three indigenous ones, 109 on the part of the, of the uh, opposition parties, plus the three indigenous um, representatives that, that come with their own organizations. Y aquí sí está entonces la distribución de, de los diputados que fueron electos en cada, en cada estado. Eh, <coughs> en el sistema electoral venezolano lo, siempre los... Uh, se eligen por lista eh, dos diputados, salvo en los tres, en los tres estados con, con, con mayor población donde se eligen tres diputados por lista. Eh, 
Eh, esos tres estados son, bueno, ya mencionamos el estado Zulia, donde se eligen tres por lista. Fíjense que están aquí dos de la oposición y uno del oficialismo. Carabobo, dos de la oposición, uno del oficialismo. Y Miranda, dos de la oposición y uno del chavismo. En todo lo demás eh, se, se reparten uno y uno, salvo en el estado Táchira, donde la, la votación por lista de la oposición más que duplicó la votación del, del oficialismo y por lo tanto los, los dos diputados listas le fueron asignados a la oposición. En todo el resto los estados se repartieron eh, uno y uno. The, the, the votes, the, the candidates that went on the lists, or the slates you say, right? And the slates are in all the states too. And usually the way they, they, it is calculated, have you counted, there's one for the, one goes for the opposition and one goes for the government. But, in, in, and, but there are, because of their populations, three states that have three by slate. And in, 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 that is Miranda, that's part of Caracas, Miranda, Zulia, Zulia where is Maracaibo, where the city of Maracaibo is, and Carabobo, where the city of Valencia is. They have three by slate. And in those cases, two went to the, to the opposition and one to the government. And, and the only state where the both went to the government were, is, no, was no, 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 no. Uh, to the opposition, I'm sorry, was the Táchira state, which is the frontier with Colombia and where there have been so many problems since 2014. They were both won by, by the opposition forces. And to win that, it means that the, the opposition forces doubled the, the, the votes double. of, the, double. of the government, more than doubled the votes of the government in that state. Y bueno, esta, esto está tomado de la misma página del Consejo Nacional Electoral, donde ahí es, así es la, la figura en colores de cómo va a estar compuesta la nueva Asamblea Nacional, donde están puestos aquí estos tres, son lo, la representación indígena, pero que como mencionó ahorita Margarita, son, fueron electos en organizaciones vinculadas con la oposición. Si comparamos los resultados que obtuvimos el 6 de diciembre con las que se obtuvieron en el mes de octubre del año 2010, que fueron las elecciones parlamentarias, parlamentarias anteriores a esta, vemos que es casi, casi el, 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 el viste en un espejo, ¿no? casi la imagen, la imagen al revés. Aunque, aunque la diferencia en votos fue muy pequeña, los dos, los dos, las dos alianzas sacaron más de 5 millones de votos y una diferencia de poco más de, de 100 mil votos. Porcentualmente la diferencia fue de 1% en el, en el 2010. En esta oportunidad fue de, casi, de un poquito más de 15%. La distribución de diputados en aquella oportunidad, el sistema electoral nuestro, eso lo voy a comentar un poquito más adelante, es un sistema que sobre representa a la mayoría y por eso una diferencia de 1% aquí se tradujo en una diferencia de más de, de 21 diputados acá. Mientras que en esta oportunidad una diferencia de 15% en, en los votos se tradujo en una diferencia de dos terceras partes de los diputados aquí. También aquí antes el oficialismo ganó en más estados que la oposición, contrario a lo que ocurre ahora y también en los circuitos electorales en la, el oficialismo ganó más que en oposición en el 2010. <coughs> Cometemos ahora el, el, lo que decía sobre el sistema electoral venezolano. Eh, en la Constitución, en el artículo 293, que es un artículo donde están, aparecen todas las funciones que debe cumplir el poder electoral, termina con este párrafo. Que este párrafo, digamos, no es la única, el, el único sitio en la Constitución donde aparece eh, alguna ideal de qué es lo que debe ser el, el sistema electoral venezolano, pero es donde me parece que está como más resumido y mejor expresado. Eh, fíjense que aquí lo que dice es que el poder electoral debe garantizar una serie de atributos que debe tener el Consejo, el, 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 los procesos electorales venezolanos, eh, 
igualdad, confiabilidad, imparcialidad, transparencia, eficiencia en el sistema electoral y dice además que debe garantizar, ¿cómo está esta traducción ahí? Que debe garantizar la personalización del sufragio, es decir, la posibilidad de que el elector vote por nombre y apellido, los candidatos que prefiera, y la representación proporcional, que la representación proporcional lo que significa es que el, el porcentaje de diputados que cada partido te, obtenga en la Asamblea Nacional debe ser más o menos similar al porcentaje de votos obtenidos. Como vimos en el cuadrito anterior, ni en el 2010 ni ahora en el 2015 eh, eso, eso ocurre. Hay una diferencia muy grande entre el porcentaje de votos obtenidos y el porcentaje de diputados asignados. Luis es, es, es uh, did a, a, a comparison between the 2010 election and parliamentary election and this 2015. And now it's showing that the, the, the article of the Constitution that says uh, that the National Electoral Council, the electoral power of Venezuela, must guarantee this, this, this group of principles, but it must guarantee the proportional representation. And what he had, has shown in both elections and that that is not happening in the electoral system of Venezuela. That if you have the majority, you will overrepresent it in the, in the, in the National Assembly. With, in, in, in 2010, with two points of difference, uh, the, the, the government had more than, how many uh, deputies? 11, 12. ¿Cuántos diputados? 21 deputies in 2010. And now, with 15 points of difference, The opposition has uh, from 55 to 112, that is uh, almost 50 some odd more uh, deputies. So there is a, a violation of this principle of the Constitution in the way the, electoral, uh, election, the elections are taking place in Venezuela, because it should be a, a proportional to, to the votes. The composition well, that's of a contradiction the law and the system, right? Yeah. Between the law and the system. Yes. Entre la ley orgánica procesos electorales y la constitución. Porque la ley orgánica procesos electorales se define el proceso electoral que viola el principio de la representación proporcional establecido en la constitución. There is a violation between the constitution and the bill. Because the constitution is one thing and the electoral bill, the regulation that is doing another thing. So, going by the Constitution, the election should not have been what it was. Neither this one, neither the one of 2010. But, but when did they, uh, I understand that the, uh, the electoral, uh, uh, the electoral... Uh, National Electoral Council. Uh -huh. Was... Uh, 2009. Uh, so, it was already uh, something uh, not, uh, which came with an, an intent of, yeah, sure. of winning uh, what they call in this country uh, Super majority. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the law, the bill, or the law, was, was, uh, was written in 2009. And so this distortion happened in 2010 and 2015. And as you said, yeah, it was written with the purpose, knowing that the government was a majority, to establish a super majority and, 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 to, and have so control in over. In Spanish, we say victimas de su propio invento. Uh, yeah, se volteó la tortilla. So now, with the same law, the, the results are like a mirror. Muy rápidamente menciona aquí entonces eh, qué es lo que podemos ver como fortaleza del sistema electoral venezolano a la luz de esta elección del 6 de diciembre y las debilidades. La fortaleza es que, bueno, siendo esta una elección parlamentaria, y los que sepan los números de las elecciones parlamentarias en los Estados Unidos podrán asombrarse. En estas elecciones votó el casi el 75% de los electores. Casi, cuatro, perdón, casi tres de cuatro electores participó en, en estas elecciones parlamentarias, que para una elección parlamentaria en términos mundiales es un, un registro muy, muy elevado lo que demuestra que a nosotros los venezolanos nos gusta mucho votar y lo hacemos con entusiasmo. Siendo, siendo que en Venezuela, después de la, elección, de la Constitución de 1999, la obligatoriedad del voto se eliminó. 
Y el voto es estrictamente voluntario. No hay ningún tipo de sanción al elector que no, que no vote. ¿Se entiende? La participación es muy alta para una elección parlamentaria. Es casi como una elección presidencial. Es casi 75% de participación. Y en in Venezuela, no estás obligado a votar. Es un voto voluntario. La gente va out masivamente to votar. El sistema electoral venezolano también es en claramente el de toda la región de América Latina y, y si lo comparamos con Estados Unidos también, un sistema altamente automatizado donde todos los, todas las fases del, del proceso eh, están siendo crecientemente automatizadas y, y, y bueno, en la elección la... la la participación humana es para poner a funcionar las máquinas, pero el voto es estrictamente automatizado. Y siendo un sistema automatizado, es un sistema que está sometido previo a las elecciones y también posterior a las elecciones a un riguroso proceso técnico de alta calidad de, de auditoría, de evaluación de los distintos, de los distintos, de los distintos programas, las distintas máquinas que intervienen en el proceso para evaluar si, si, funcionan, si funcionan adecuadamente. Y son auditorías que se hacen con participación de todos los actores políticos. O sea, que es una cosa eh, abierta y, y, y que se revisa con, con mucho detenimiento. Yo particularmente como observador electoral eh, he participado como observador de esos procesos de auditoría y puedo dar garantías que se hacen que se hace bien. Huh? The, 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 these process, the, 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 the electoral day, the voting day, is a very transparent uh, procedure. It is all completely automatic. You vote in a machine, and it has been audited many times before that by technicians of the, oppos of, of the opposition as well as the government. And he is an observer, a national observer in Venezuela, also goes to the auditings prior to the day of the voting. And it is a very safe and transparent, the, the results are very safe and transparent the day of the election. Aquí hay un dato de, una, de un, un circuito en particular que, que, que tiene la particularidad que fue el circuito donde se asignó el último diputado. Y se asignó el último diputado porque como podrán ver allí, la diferencia de votos Fue chiquita, ¿no? 82 votos en, siendo que ambos, ambos candidatos sacaron casi 70 mil votos, o sea, son 82 votos en un volumen de, de votos muy, muy grande. Eh, la diferencia es de 0,06%, una diferencia absolutamente mínima, y, y bueno, y, ese, y en ese circuito el, el diputado asignado era, fue de la oposición. Eh, para aquello hay, hay los radicales de la oposición que siempre han dicho que el sistema electoral venezolano es un sistema fraudulento esto es una, me parece una muestra bien contundente de que, de que por ahí no van los tiros la, la, eh, ahí la cosa funciona, funciona bien, siendo además que en este circuito, y este es un dato interesante, hubo este casi 16 mil votos nulos una diferencia de 82 votos entre los dos candidatos que llegaron del primero al segundo y con 16 mil votos en nulo. How long has this honesty and transparency been in place in Venezuelan elections? It has been progressive. It has been progressive. Eh, it started with the Constitution. It, it, it is obliged by Constitution. And so since the Constitution is in place, 1999, they have been doing this, but 100% Automatic, it's been how many elections now? Two or three, automatizado completamente. Completamente, cuatro o cinco elecciones. Like four or five last elections. Yo he estado en cosas de observación electoral prácticamente desde el referéndum revocatorio que se hizo en el 2004. Y, y en términos numéricos, yo siempre he dicho los resultados son esos. Siempre he, he, he pensado que digamos, no, hay, no hay fraude en el conteo de votos, digamos. <coughs> Pero el sistema electoral venezolano también esta vez nuevamente mostró que tiene debilidades. Y las debilidades, bueno, lo mencionó ahorita, claramente esta violación de la representación proporcional hace que, eh, digamos, eso es una violación porque en la Constitución dice que el sistema venezolano debe ser de representación proporcional. 
Hay muchas democracias en el mundo donde, eh, donde no existe el principio de la, de la representación proporcional. Ejemplo, los Estados Unidos es un sistema mayoritario, no es un sistema de representación proporcional. A mí particularmente me gusta mucho más el sistema de representación proporcional, pero eso son cosas culturales. En Venezuela siempre, ha existido el sistema de, siempre había existido el sistema de representación proporcional que terminó siendo derogado de hecho con la ley orgánica de procesos electorales aprobada en el año 2009. Aquí está lo que hace, lo que hace son ejemplos de, de cómo la representación proporcional no, no, es respet, no, no ha sido respetada en las últimas elecciones. Aquí está particularmente en el distrito capital. Eh, These are examples of how it is, it is not a representative, a proportional representative. Um, Election. What should have happened in the federal district, in the district of the capital? Eh, en esta, digamos, el, el distrito capital tiene, si vemos en el 2010, ¿qué pasó? En el 2010 se elegían 10 diputados. Quedaron prácticamente empatados. Pero por el diseño electoral terminó la, el oficialismo teniendo 7 diputados y la oposición 3 nada más. Si hubiese habido representación proporcional, hubieran sido 5 y 5. En esta oportunidad, la, el, por, por variaciones en la población, en el distrito capital se eligieron 9 diputados, uno menos que en el 2010. Con representación proporcional, hubiera correspondido 5 y 4, 5 de la oposición y 4 del oficialismo, pero la distribución que se hizo fue de, de 8 a 1, a favor de la oposición. O sea, muy sobre representado eh, el, el for those fuerza that, mayoritaria. Pero no follow it, we're talking about Caracas, the, the, the capital district. In 2010, it had 10 deputies, and the votes of the opposition and the votes of the government were very tight, they were almost the same. Uh, but there was a, a slight majority to the government, and then it came out with how many? Seven deputies and three the opposition, <coughs> instead of being five and five, if it would be proportional representation. This time, the, the capital district had nine deputies, and the, and the difference in favor of the opposition was more, no? Sí, sí, pero, pero, but it ended up, it should have had four and five, and it ended up with eight and one. Eight and one. That's, the, that's how it, the, the electoral system has been... Uh, act, uh, has, has, has been transformed by the, by the bill of the electoral procedures of the year 2009. Is that And, because of the district vote? They won all the districts yeah. or the guidance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. eh, bueno, la, la, estas elecciones nuevamente mostraron una altísima polarización. En esta oportunidad en, en, fue 97.13% el, la concentración de votos entre los dos polos mayoritarios. Había un otro poco de candidatos, pero eso sacaron el, el remanente, eso en menos de 3%. Y en el estado menos polarizado, podemos llamarlo así, la polarización alcanzó un 94%, casi 95%. O sea que una, una, y allá hay una historia particular, pero bueno, pero Es una muy highly polarized uh, uh, political situation. So the people do not, and because of this kind of system, the people vote for the opposition that they think can win and for the government. A third alternatives practically don't have life in this, in this kind of political uh, arrangement, electoral arrangement. So the polarization here went up to 90 some odd. Uh, 97. 97, the sum of the votes of, of the government and the votes of the opposition. Y the other, the other alternative, there were several there, had, had the, the rest to, to, to an some odd percent. Los mayores problemas en las, elecciones, en las elecciones en Venezuela no son tanto el día de las elecciones, sino todo el proceso previo a las elecciones. Y en este proceso previo, bueno, hubo problemas con la renovación de los rectores del Consejo Nacional Electoral que se hizo en diciembre. Eh, hubo demoras innecesarias para asignar, eh, para anunciar la fecha y el cronograma de actividades para las elecciones de diciembre, eh, demora en la definición de las circunscripciones y en el número de diputados que iban a ser electos en cada una de ellas, 
eh, uso de recursos jurídicos con fines políticos, fueron inhabilitados potenciales candidatos de la oposición, fueron también intervenidos direcciones políticas de partido tanto de grupos vinculados al gobierno como de grupos vinculados a la oposición para modificar su comportamiento en la postulación de candidato. Hubo una reglamentación eh, fuera de tiempo y, y nosotros pensamos que, que sobrepasando las atribuciones del Consejo Nacional Electoral sobre paridad de género, eh, en Venezuela, como en muchas partes del mundo, la política es machista y hay una, una, una disposición del Consejo Nacional Electoral intentando introducir correctivos en eso, pero hecho en un momento donde la Constitución establece que no pueden cambiarse las reglas del juego y además sobrepasando las atribuciones del mismo Consejo Nacional Electoral porque es una cosa que debería estar incorporada en la ley y no en un reglamento. The, the, the problems in Venezuela do not have to do with the day of the voting, but all the procedure of the electoral process before that, the campaign and before the campaign, where the, the abuses of the governments are, are important, and of the Natural Electoral uh, Council that is subordinated to the government. Uh, but but in, in terms of, uh, it, it was the, the, the three of the five authorities of the National Electoral, uh, electoral Council were named two years after they, their, their terms had expired, and through uh, an illegal, uh, an irregular procedure through the, uh, the, the tribune, the, the, the Supreme Tribune, um, the date, the agenda of the electoral process was all alterated and done out of timings. There was a, a, a rule given by the National Electoral Council to bring parity, a, a, a gender equality that was done out of times because The law said it could not be do, you cannot change the rules of the election six months before the elections, and it was done after it was done during after after the, the, the six months had, had, were already running, and 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 like that, well, the use of the public uh, public resources, no, 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 se editaron estados de excepción en 28 municipios fronterizos con Colombia que, que hicieron que la, que la campaña electoral en esos municipios fuese muy limitada. Eh, mal uso de, de fondos públicos que está expresamente prohibido por la ley pero que se utiliza de manera evidente por todos los actores. La presidencia lo hizo con, con mucho... Con mucho despliegue, pero también los, los gobernadores de oposición hicieron, hicieron eh, usos de, eh, de recursos de, la goberna, de sus gobernaciones para campaña electoral. Activa participación de, de funcionarios públicos en campaña, que también está expresamente prohibido por la ley. Problemas con, con la observación internacional, eso seguramente eso fue muy publicitado en la prensa y seguramente ustedes lo, lo habrán visto. Eh, la posibilidad o no, tuvimos buena parte de los meses de este año, eh, si la voy a participar o no en la, como, observador, como observación internacional, en definitiva no participó como observación internacional. Y claramente a lo largo, todas las encuestas de opinión mostraban que en general lo, lo, los votantes sentían una creciente desconfianza en la imparcialidad del Consejo Nacional Electoral, pero eso no les disminuía su eh, decisión y participación a votar como de hecho ocurrió. Y me callo. <risa> Gracias. ¿eh? Gracias muy bien. Gracias. Gonna just, gonna... Entonces, Mauricio va a ofrecer algunas preguntas cerradas y remarks. I don't know how all that question and answer period. Well, I think what is, what is clear from the results of the election that the people went out and in a way a, 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 an important port, proportion of the vote uh, was to punish uh, the government for the huge crisis that they are in. I think that that is quite clear of the voting. It was a massive participation. It was about, uh, around 75%. It was a plebiscitarian logic. The people really didn't care that much who the candidate was. They wanted to send a message out. 
a message that they want a political change, whatever this we can talk about in the discussion, what a political change means. Um, in, in the numbers, we see that the Chavistas lose in relation to the presidential uh, elections of 2013 <coughs> 2 million votes in this occasion. And um, in, in comparison to Chavez's 2012 election, well, six months before Maduro was elected in 2013, the Chavismo loses 2,000 and a half million, two, two million and a half uh, votes, uh, which is a, a, is, a, is, is a number interesting to see because the opposition forces only gain in comparison to the elections of, of, of President Maduro they only gained 356,607 <laughs> votes. So those two million votes that, 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 that the government forces lose, only a, a small proportion went out to vote for, for the opposition <laughs> forces, which shows us something that it says, it is frequently said in theory that when the people are disenchanted first, they stop voting, they don't participate. And then afterwards they will take, if this continues, probably they will take the steps towards some other more active action. Abstention in this case was five million of votes. And I think it, it in a way, part of those five million votes are showing uh, where the, 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 that that was the preferred way that disenchanted Chavistas took in this election. So I think just to, to wrap up, we would say this is, I think it is the beginning of a, an important decline of the Chavistas. Is it possible for them to recover from this in the short term? It's, it's difficult to say. I think it depends a lot on how they're going to act in the following months. The legislative power has recovered pluralism and independence to the executive in our pattern of socialism of the 21st century, all the political powers were subordinated to the executive. Now we have the recovery of the legislative power that is independent and separate from the executive. And, um, and, 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 and through that executive legislative power, we may be able, if, uh, if the, the dynamic of politics takes place, we may be able to begin to recover the other public powers as independent uh, and separate powers from the executive. It, that is to say, we may be able to recover the liberal representative <clears throat> institutions that the Constitution of 1999 guarantees. But these are big challenges ahead, not only for the political actors, but also for the Venezuelan people. The first things that we have to ask is, will the Chavismo accept democratic political procedures? Until now, the, they haven't shown too, too many good uh, signs, of it, especially the government, of accepting the, the results, even though that night they accepted that they had lost. What they have done in the following days it doesn't, it isn't quite the recognition of a loss or of a defeat. <coughs> At the same time, we must ask ourselves, but. I need this, we have the second part of her presentation because that, all of that is in slides. Oh, you can put it there, I think. <coughs> the other thing that we must also recognize is that Chavismo had five million votes, more than five million votes, and it still is a powerful political, um, <coughs> political power and must be recognized also by the forces of the opposition in, in, in what is to be the, the dynamic of politics in 2016. And finally, I would like to say that the, in, in the immediate, the most important probably features of, of a political dynamic in Venezuela is the capacity to recognize the defeat, the capacity to, to recognize that the legislative has become an arena for negotiation, recognition, and, and negotiation uh, between uh, the, 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 the different uh, uh, political powers in Venezuela and to resolve the, day, the everyday problems of the Venezuelan people. If, 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 if these problems cannot be resolved only by the government or only by the opposition, they need an, a space of dialogue, of recognition, and of negotiation, on, especially on the economic uh, measures that, have, that, have, that would resolve the, the, the free fall of the economy in Venezuela at this moment, and that have to be done properly through a political pact 
that the government should recognize that the message of these elections was a political. People want a change in the way power has been exercised in the last years. They want to change in, in the performance of the government, and they want to overcome, as this, uh, many surveys have shown us, they want to overcome this polarized situation in which the government and the opposition cannot sit down, talk, and negotiate a way out. And then when we do pick up now three questions or call a very short comment, we don't have time for more. But I, I think I will start with Rita. You know, the, if you count the, I mean, when Venezuelan democracy after Perez Jimenez, uh, that cycle lasted 20 years, democracy 20, 20 some years, right? 40 years. 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40 years, double that. But again, we had the same problem. So these problems are not really new in the sense of no. corruption, no. 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 the misuse of oil money. I have been reading uh, figures on how much Venezuela, the country, collected because of oil. It's in the hundreds of billions That's since then. So corruption took a big part of that and in that old system for the last 40 years. And it seems to be there still, right? So it's a misspent, missed opportunities historically. Uh, in any case, I just wanted to bring that up as a question, as a comment, and as a question, which is what is in Venezuelan society? And you began to allude to that, Marita, in that uh, this rentist, rentismo mm -hmm. is able to perpetuate this pattern in which uh, uh, corruption leads to what is part of terrible bureaucracy, inefficiency, bloated service, bloated structures. Uh, and lack of inability to deliver services. Of course, the Chavez revolution, if so to speak, the Bolivarian revolution, came about as a reaction to that, the old crisis. So we seem to be repeating the cycles. And as you pointed out, the, the, the ruptures come in moments in, in which the oil price drops. <laughs> drops. Yeah. So that's just taking a comment and some, perhaps a question. So who, who, any questions? Yes. I want to address. This I, have a, I have a question. Uh, it's about how, for this next period, uh, it's going to be in general, uh, it's going to be possible to retrieve the institution so much influenced by the Cuban regime. That's my question. So the question is why any possibly with the new period, which is the National Assembly member. Mm -hmm. So, to retrieve the public institutions, take it away, they have, how possibly they are going to take that away from the influence of the Cuban regime? Well, mm -hmm. well that's the second or third question, second, right? Mm -hmm. Somehow, uh, I wanted to ask the same question, but that, uh, that uh, I will go a bit further uh, about the contradictions within the the the, the chavismo. Uh, 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 I got the impression that uh, it was not just uh, the matter of uh, lack of uh, the charisma, uh, but uh, also. Uh, it was telling that uh, people like uh, Giordani uh, left, and apparently he's now actually being uh, very, very critical. Uh, and, but to begin with, uh, to be honest, uh, I think that it is not just a lack of charisma. I think uh, Chavez uh, uh, himself uh, uh, see the 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 the. the Planted the seeds of, of the destruction of, of if it, it goes that way. So that's a common one of the question. Let's go to you had a question? Yes, you did, you did. Yes, I do. Uh, while the Ms. Lopez made a representation, I like the statement is she says something to respect uh, the constitution of the uh, of Venezuela. I like it. But as I'm talking about confuse, and my confusion comes along with the following point. There are several international intelligence organizations and also churches. That indicates that Maduro was born in Colombia <laughs> and not in Venezuela. So that's a violation 
I cannot understand that because he never presented the citizenship of Venezuela as a fact. Can you elaborate that, please? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We have we have four four comments of questions. Well, Margarita, let's reply to these. Now we'll take another three. We can. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh, Professor Font. That, that's, what I'm trying to say is that this is a cycle that has come back and come back, and we've a hundred years almost of oil economy, and it just gets worse. I mean, it's not it's not really a, 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 a vicious circle, but like a vicious a, a spiral. It just gets getting worse and worse because you don't resolve the structural problem that is at the, beneath everything. That is, we need to come up with some kind of economic model that can sustain the the, the economy without bringing in the oil revenue. Just because that is what has been happening, and in this case, and in this, we have to be very critical of, of Chase to Party, but they never gave really a, an, a seriously thought of an alternative economic model. They did not. They just, as 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 the old elites did in the past, they said, "Oh, this is not going to end never." And if it ends like it happened in 2009, that the prices <laughs> dropped and the sword in the in the graphic, they said, Charles, what did Charles do? And the president said, I'll, I'll wait. It, it, what comes down goes up again. And then it, you wait six or seven and eight months. That happened the last time in 2009. The price is picked up, and then we forgot about it again. And this time, it's been two years, and they haven't picked up. And so the tragedy has opened in all its splendor, so, so to say. So this is something that I think is a responsibility, not only of the political elites, but also of the, of the, of the citizens, of the people of Venezuela that have to understand that uh, they cannot rely on the oil I income that is coming from the capitalist system for the international markets and the prices, because it, today we are 30 million of Venezuelans, and it is... It, how much the money comes in, it will never be enough. And it doesn't bring an egalitarian society. It brings a very uh, disequal society and a very corrupt society, too. Uh, maybe I am a, a, a bit uh, naive, but I, I do think that this is this that happened uh, on the 6th of December is very important for Venezuela and could be a turning point if the actors know how to move in this delicate situation. Because the legislative is, as is very powerful. And the Venezuelans gave the, the, the opposition forces the three majorities. So they have the capacity to control the executive, to remove ministers, secretaries of, of the cabinet if they do not come up with the numbers and show that they are performing according to, to they, they, it has, it could also, it, 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 it has many uh, attributes. In the last years, Maduro travels with two planes, two presidential planes, taking his family, the friends of his kids, and every, and all this. And he goes out with all these big people. And now he has to. He, the constitution says that he, if he leaves for more than five days, he has to ask permit to the National Assembly. Before, I didn't care because between 2010 and 2015, he controlled the National Assembly. So they didn't. They didn't. They didn't even bother to go there and ask permit. But now he has to say, why is, why is he going out? Why is he spending so much going out? Why is he taking the children and the friends of his children to, the, to these trips and his aunts and, his, and whoever? And what is the purpose of the trip? In the first week of January, uh, Nicolás, President Nicolás Maduro has to give the state of the, of the nation. In the, last, in the last years, he just appears there and gives a, a political discourse. He doesn't give figures or anything. As a matter of fact, last year, we don't have any official figures of the, the production of the GDP in Venezuela, was the inflation, all these things that is an obligation of the president. Well, he will have to do it this year. If he does not do these things, he is subject to certain sanctions that are there in the Constitution. And also, if you don't follow the procedures, to name the, 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 the authorities of the other electoral powers, the legislative has the power to, to say, this was not done. We have to do it again. So I mean, this is something that I think is, is very interesting. Uh, as far as they, 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 they stay united, there could be 
uh, um, even I think it, it would be very positive for Venezuela that you go advancing in the recovery, not rapid, but little by little, of spaces of power in a, in a democratic transition. But we don't have a de democracy right now. About the contradictions inside Chavismo. They are there, they are developing. Um, I, as a matter of fact, Giordani, Hector Navarro, these who were uh, ministers of the cabinet of Chavez have been very critical in the, in, with Maduro ever since he began, because Maduro put them aside. They were too much uh, equal to Maduro and put them aside. And they have been very critical to them. The trouble with these men and women uh, of, of the cabinets of Maduro that uh, today are very critical to, to uh, President Nicolás Maduro is that they really don't have political capital. I mean, they, they really can't do very much. They don't have, uh, they can criticize him, but uh, they all were men of Chavez. They don't have their own political force inside the party or any of that. So I think it is important as a discourse of critique that may... Um, illuminate some of the bases of the people that vote for, for the Chavismo, but they really, I don't, I don't have too much expectations that they can be a political alternative. Some of them are very old too, like Jorge Giordani and Ali Rodriguez. As for Maria Socialista, that is, this, that is a, an organization that has come out, also very critique, and that says that uh, Maduro uh, threw away the legacy of Hugo Chavez, they are basically intellectuals, and I said they're basically like me. I mean, the, the possibilities of these people uh, gathering the votes of the Chavista are, are, are very unlikely. So I think that the, it is more likely that if the, the, the high, the upper groups of the today dominant Venezuela of Chavismo, like the groups of Nicolás Maduro, Diosdado Cabello, the military that are there, and so on, if they don't react, this is going into decline and could be going into extinction because they really are throwing away. I mean, this is a very powerful message that has been sent to them that they have to do some political change. Uh, about the, uh, the influence of Cuba, that's something that I wanted to say related to what I said about the, pow the powers that the legis legislative power has in Venezuela. This, I mean, this coming back of spaces where pluralism can recover and, and, and democratic uh, procedures can come back has very little uh, possibility the Cubans to do anything. As a matter of fact, I think, of course, this is always very obscure, the information about the influence of the Cubans in the Venezuelan government, but ever, be, ever since they knew of the sickness of, 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 Nicolas, of, of Hugo Chavez, they have been their own plans in order to, 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 to be detached and not depend so much on Venezuela. And they have now opened to the United States and have been opening to other paths because they know that this is running out of time, that, that this, is, this is not going to last much more. As if, if Maduro was born in Venezuela or was born in Cuba, <laughs> I mean, it forms part... It, I think it is. Uh, it could be used in a moment uh, of severe political crisis for him, because, as you say, he actually has never shown his his birth document. And if he would be Venezuelan, I think he would have shown it by now. <laughs> that's that's my 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 impression. And he hasn't shown it. It must be because something something's wrong there. But the president has so much power that until now there has not been any possibility of doing anything about that because it's. He, the, he controlled, the executive controls the Supreme Tribune. He controls the National Assembly. He controls it. There were no checks and balances in Venezuela, so there was nothing that could be done. But, it, but it's there. It's there, and it, it could be it's just one of those things that could appear with importance. We are now to the second cycle of questions and comments. I I'll, I'll have used my prerogatives, and that's the first one. Again, yeah, you want to show the new faces, emerging faces. And the question for you, Margarita, is whether there is, do you have high expectations of the new leaders and the, of the opposition? Are they a coherent force? One of the interesting things. She is didn't go to the National Assembly. Lilian, Lilian Tintori, who was a remarkable role of the last phase. And then Karin uh, Slano and Diputada Cinto Dose. Yeah, I think the last one she came in. We were referring to that she was the one at work. The victory, but they reflect different forces, right? Different yes. parties. Yes, and then we get behind them. Well, our 
more established leaders, the Capriles, and then uh, Leopoldo Lopez was in jail. I just found out this morning that uh, Leopoldo Lopez was actually went to school in Princeton, mm. Hunt School in mm. Princeton in the township mm. as a kid, uh, elementary school. Mm. Very well educated, remarkable leader, but obviously there are tensions, Margarita, between also and differentiations in the leadership. How hopeful are you, Margarita? That's a question. Uh -huh. That in fact the opposition will do better in terms of coherent, advancing a coherent position for Venezuela. So that's my question. Samuel. Yeah. Uh, in 89, I think it, uh, following what uh, uh, Dr. Amaya was saying, Carlos Alves won and he brought up a, a package of reforms that were kind of deep that, uh, to the point that, you know, brought the Caracasio and brought the, uh, exacerbated the, the uh, dissension among the, uh, among the, uh, the, with the armed forces. And how much of those reforms definitely have to come back? Because <laughs> what Carlos Andres was uh, uh, presenting was a deep reform within the state. Uh, privatization, privatization, uh, a lot of things that maybe were not well articulated, even though when you see the numbers now and see the numbers what that on what Carlos Andres received, we're pretty much in a very serious condition. So we're bad numbers for the people and for the government to maneuver economically and politically. So my question is how much of those reasonable forms and the people that really did an amazing job, we can criticize the question the, the, the application of that can come back because I don't think there will be any. And how much is the political cost? Yeah, I want to hear a bit about an economic program because uh, you're in desperate trouble economically. And I don't know where the, the power sits for that. To do is with the executive, but they haven't shown any signs of uh, dealing with that. By the way, we're going to have him win on the own route through this cycle of questions. <laughs> so, so, no, no, you're the, you're the third one. And then he, and then you, and then we'll close. And then have our wine. We have to close. With the building closes at 6 o'clock or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Professor, what I will say, thank you very much. A wonderful, wonderful, completely agree with your analysis. If given these two, two questions, how do you see uh the people checking out what is happening or what happened from from the fifth on you know how and you know we know we have only one position newspaper with two pages uh all the channels are, how my fear i've been living here for a long long time by my whole family is there my fear is how is the, the, the people going to check what is going on and see if they are being represented in whatever measures the assembly start taking. All right, and then uh, we have a last question. <laughs> My question is about the, the recently uh, evidence of the connection be between the, the high, high, higher power in the Chavism with the drug, um, the drug uh, ma 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 marketing. Uh, uh, what is the, if this is true, what can be the consequence in a, a future, uh, 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 the, the future of, of the politician, politician uh, future of, of our country? Well, you have some questions, Miguel. The last slide. Yeah, Margarita, go ahead. Oh, I wanted to, but I wanted to talk about the position with this slide. That's why I put so it there. You want to go back? Oh, you did the uh, whole last way. Yeah, then we can kind of wait. So should we start? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I, I had this slide that I didn't want to use in the beginning to not talk so much, but the opposition is in a very big challenge because I would say that... Um, I can't go into whole, the whole evolution of the, of the opposition because, as many of you know, the opposition began as, a, as a first in, in one kind of platform that was called the, the Coordinadora Democratica, but now it, this is another kind of electoral platform that is basically of the political parties and not like the one in the past. And that has been moving, developing since 2010 with a very um, important um, 
Success in electoral uh, strategies. It has been able to little by little gain more trust, little by little gain more uh, electoral uh, votes, and uh, has, has brought united candidates and united strategies and has been pretty successful. It has new leadership. It has young, young guys, girls, and, and, and women and men. But it, but it is a very diverse world. And, the, 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 and today, the big challenge of that is if they can go beyond the electoral strategies and come in with a, a, a political strategy to negotiate with the government in the legislative. This is the big challenge. And nobody can give an answer. Uh, they have learned a lot, I think. They have been very repressed politically. Some of their leaders are in jail. I wonder if, if they have how much have they learned uh, beyond the electoral, uh, you know, the electoral um, skills that they have had uh, to to win and, and come up to this result today. Mm. It has to do a lot also, sometimes I say this, with the comprehension of the country, that the country cannot go back to representative liberal democracy as it was seen in the past. Today we have a constitution that is a participatory constitution that combines those institutions that have been lost during Chavismo, the liberal institutions of the separation and independence of the public powers, the checks and balances, the pluralism, uh, and, and, and uh, the, uh, the autonomy of the central bank. These things have been lost in the socialist model of the 21st century. But they are there. They are in place in our constitution. They have to come back. But the other mechanisms of direct democracy and participatory democracy have to be respected also by the opposition. I mean, because those were won by the Venezuelan people and it can help them very much in enforcing and strengthening the political, the, uh, the power of the legislative. Because if the government does not want to negotiate, they're going to have to go to the streets and, and activate direct mechanisms in order to find the back, the support of the people, in order to advance in a, in a, in a, demo, in a transition towards democracy. So I, I think that, that I would answer about the opposition, about how can the people check on this. Again, I say this is a problem not only of the political parties, of the people too. How much have we learned that we cannot wait for another prosperity of the prices of oil and then try to grab the, the rent for our social sectors? I mean, we have to learn that we win what we earn, we, we earn what we work for. In Venezuela, we have rights and rights and rights, but we don't have uh, the duties that, that accompany to that. As for... Um, how much of the reforms of Carlos Andres will, will have to be implemented now, and is, if there are any kinds of economic programs. I could say the following, because I'm not an economist, but I do go to a lot of panels. I have a lot of friends. I, I'm in these social networks of economists. And, and it seems to me that there is a consensus of what has to be done to stop this uh, in the immediate time. There's a lot of thought. We have brilliant economists about this, and they have been a consensus. I would say that there, today I really don't know of it, not even a Chavista economist like Victor Alvarez, for example, that in common sense says, well, we have to, we have to get out of this craziness of four exchange rates of the, of the dollar. We have to devaluate. We have to uh, uh, raise the, the price of oil. Uh, of gasoline in Venezuela. We have to look at the, the corporation contracts that we have. We have to uh, uh, charge the people that, that owe us. There are a series of immediate measures that can be done that could, uh, what Felipe Perez Martí, that was once a minister of Chavez and economy says, that could stop the free fall and, and, and this where we are right now that we're like in the third basement and put us again to the ground. And in that, there is a lot of consensus. There's a lot of consensus that we can get to the ground more or less reasonably fast. But to build what kind of, a, of alternative economic model, that's another question. We have never agreed since the 80s and the 90s when the COPE came up with all the political reforms of decentralization and participation, and, and we started electing governors and mayors, because we did not do that in the, in, in, in the first decades of our democracy, there was consensus to go to decentralization and more participation. But there was never consensus of what kind of model. So the combination of market, 
with state in Venezuela is a, ta a very severe test. How much market do we need? I mean, we, we can't stop criminal. Stop, we have to stop criminalizing the market because this is the result of criminalizing the market. But I mean, we can't and then put away the, 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 the state and reduce the state to nothing because I mean, Venezuela is a petrol state. It will always be a powerful state. So we have to find that combination in order to advance in some kind of project that doesn't go to these extremes that we have seen in Venezuela because we are extremists. I don't know if this has, I think it has to do with the rentistic culture that we kind of go into all these extremes, you know, and we have these fantasies as Fernando Coronel said, when we have this magical state, we can do anything. Our society is like clay and the, and the elites, political elites in power. Now we're going to go to the first world, like Alondres told us. Oh no, now we're going to a bit of socialism that nobody ever knew, and we're going to live happily ever after and so on. But we have to come to up to the floor, to the ground. And finally, the drug business is, is a very severe matter in Venezuela. There are some serious books that have talked about that. I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced that it is, has penetrated the Venezuelan state, and um, especially in the military, but also in some civilian. Now we have the, 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 the nephews of, um, of, of, the first lady. of the first lady here in New York, in, J in jail. They were caught negotiating 800 kilos of, of, of cocaine in, in Haiti. So we can see these are these, these, the, the guy yesterday, the day before yesterday was presented, was, is, a, is, a, is a nephew of, of, of Celia that was, that was raised in her house. I mean, he's like his, she, he is, she is his mother practically. So we can have an idea there. But there are also some books that have been very serious. One of them, Amidre Camero, that was the head of the department of, of the drug department against drugs in, in Venezuela during Chavez's uh, government. So what is the effect on that? I think we have to look at Colombia <laughs> and see how that was there, how that evolved there. It doesn't, I mean, how do we clean that? How do we get rid of that? I mean, it, it's a very serious problem, but I really don't have the answers. Of, but I think we have to compare ourselves with other countries that have gone into this mess and how, in the case, I think Colombia that is more near, that has very much similarities, and they had their militaries in there too, and many other things, that we would have to like study more comparative perspectives in order to, to find the help, to find the ideas, to find the policies in order to put a stop to that. But it's going to take time. And the first thing that we have to do, I think, is we have to go to a transition to democracy. Because without democracy, we can't do any of these things that we're talking about. Well, Venezuela's here to stay. We'll go back to this theme in the weeks and months to come. I'm sure in 2016, one we'll more time, Margarita Lopez Maya, Cosora, Luis Dander.